Have you ever thought about getting a nose job? Well, today I'll be talking about one of my favorite procedures, and that is the rhinoplasty. And no, I'm not talking about this guy. The word rhinoplasty comes from a combination of two Greek terms, rhino for nose and plasty for shaping. Together, they describe one of the quintessential plastic surgery procedures performed today. So let's get started. Did you know that one of the very first plastic surgery procedures ever performed was in fact a nasal reconstruction? It was carried out in India by one of the very first plastic surgeons in human history. His name was Sushruta, and in 600 BC, he performed what is referred to as the Indian flap, where he reconstructed a nose using a patch of forehead skin. What's even more interesting is that this procedure is still being performed today. Now, from those early beginnings, rhinoplasty has remained a core procedure in plastic surgery with about 220,000 cases being performed yearly, according to the American Society of Plastic Surgeons. Now, I think that everyone will agree that the nose is the central feature of the face and imparts character to the individual, sometimes good and other times not so great. Concepts of beauty, self-esteem, ethnicity, and even qualities of good and evil are often attributed to the nose. This is well represented from the earliest historic records to the more modern fashion magazines and social media outlets. Aside from the obvious aesthetic importance of the nose, it plays a vital role in breathing. Structures inside the nose are responsible for warming, filtering, and even humidifying air as it is exchanged with the outside world. Muscles and soft cartilage structures resist the collapsing forces produced when taking a deep breath in or when exercising heavily. Needless to say, the nose is one of the more vital structures of the human body that plays an important role in its function and in our daily social interactions and perceptions of ourselves. So who really needs a rhinoplasty and why? There are really two reasons why someone might seek a rhinoplasty. We've already alluded to what those two reasons might be. Take, for example, the classic case of getting hit on the nose and sustaining a fracture resulting in a crooked nose. In this setting, a person may experience not only the visual deformity, but an issue with breathing. To correct these two issues, bones must be realigned and cartilage repaired and strengthened symmetrically to restore proper breathing. During this process of creating symmetry for the sake of breathing better, we see a simultaneous improvement with the overall symmetry and appearance of the nose. There are several categories of rhinoplasty. The the most common form is called a primary rhinoplasty or a first-time rhinoplasty. This constitutes the vast majority of rhinoplasty procedures being performed worldwide. A secondary rhinoplasty is also known as a revision rhinoplasty. And by definition, this is performed after an initial or primary rhinoplasty has already been performed. Why people seek a secondary rhinoplasty can be for the two reasons we already discussed. The most common scenario is when a patient is dissatisfied with the appearance after a primary rhinoplasty and wants a correction. Alternatively, or sometimes in addition to wanting the cosmetic improvement, a patient might want to improve certain breathing problems that continue to persist after the original rhinoplasty. Many times, an additional cartilage source is required to strengthen the nose. That is because during a primary rhinoplasty, cartilage from the septum is used to provide support and may not be available if a secondary rhinoplasty is required. In this setting, rib cartilage is a great source of robust material that can fulfill this need. There are other types of rhinoplasty that are less common. A person born with a cleft lip, for example, often has a persistent deformity of the nose that will need to be corrected. This is similar to a revision or a secondary rhinoplasty, but has some additional features that increase its difficulty, including underdeveloped cartilage and skin, as well as significant scar tissue that has resulted from multiple prior attempts at correction. The term ethnic rhinoplasty refers to the preservation of the ethnic character of the nose. In reality, it's not much different than a standard rhinoplasty, with the exception that certain structures may be different, such as skin thickness, cartilage strength, and even the nasal bone structure. The focus of an ethnic rhinoplasty is to preserve the patient's ethnicity while correcting the proportions of the nose. Finally, liquid rhinoplasty has recently gained popularity as a low-cost and minimally invasive option to improve only the appearance of the nose. This refers to the injection of filler substance, such as hyaluronic acid or sometimes fat, to mask undesirable features such as a subtle hump on top of the nose or a droopy tip or a deep 
radix, that's the area between the eyes. The main downside is that results are not permanent and will need to be repeated. There have been also reports of serious complications related to the inadvertent injection of filler into blood vessels in and around the nose, causing some significant complications, such as skin loss and rarely blindness. These injections should only be performed by a certified plastic surgeon with the appropriate experience and training. There are just a couple other details that are important when considering rhinoplasty. The first involves the approach taken by the plastic surgeon. In an open approach, the skin along the thin central area at the base of the nose, called the columella, is cut and extended into the nostrils. This gives the surgeon plenty of access and visibility by allowing the skin to be lifted out of the way to reveal the underlying cartilage and bone that will need to be reshaped. This approach is often used by the beginner rhinoplasty surgeon and for teaching purposes since it does provide improved visibility and access than the other available method. Now a closed rhinoplasty will avoid the external skin cut and will only utilize the incisions inside the nostrils to gain access to all of the underlying structures. Through these incisions, all of the same manipulations and maneuvers can be performed as they would be in an open rhinoplasty. Now admittedly, the approach used is not necessarily going to alter the results in any significant way since the surgeon's experience is ultimately going to be a more important factor. However, every surgeon has his or her own biases. Having performed over 1,500 rhinoplasties in my career using both techniques, I've settled on exclusively performing the closed technique. Why? There are several reasons for this. First, keeping the nasal skin intact will avoid the possibility of an unsightly notched scar underneath the nose that may sometimes be very noticeable, usually in the profile or side view. Although this problem is rare, it can ruin an otherwise beautiful rhinoplasty result. Second, and this is the more important reason, keeping the skin intact during the surgery will reveal all the minute-to-minute -minute corrections happening to the nose with each subtle maneuver. A small increase in tip length can be a appreciated in real time as it relates to the bridge or dorsum of the nose. Refinements of the tip can be adjusted immediately instead of waiting until the end of the surgery when the skin is redraped over the cartilage components as in an open rhinoplasty. In addition, a swollen skin envelope can conceivably compress the delicate tip cartilage, creating a rounding out or drooping effect. Lastly, some have suggested that swelling can be less intense when the skin is not completely lifted off the nose and the columella. This is not necessarily a scientifically proven fact, but some Something that has been noticed by rhinoplasty surgeons who have done extensive numbers of these surgeries. Let's talk about advances in rhinoplasty. Although the fundamentals of rhinoplasty and the understanding of nasal anatomy haven't changed much, technical refinements have helped make rhinoplasty more predictable and less prone to complications. Enter the preservation rhinoplasty. Let's describe what this is, then jump into why it's such a great philosophical advance. Preservation rhinoplasty refers to maximal preservation and minimal disruption of nasal structures, including bones and cartilage. In general, this involves minimal cartilage excision, minimal disruption or fracturing of the nasal bones, and minimal elevation of the overlying skin. Now, in concept, this all sounds great, but it could often lead to milder results that may underwhelm, and it's not for everybody. Instead, I prefer a technique known as dorsal preservation. What is this? Essentially, it's taking the concept of preservation rhinoplasty and applying it from the bridge down to the middle of the nose. This will preserve the vital external and internal relationships of the nose as the roof or sides of the nose meet with the septum in the middle. This will maintain excellent breathing mechanics and avoid irregularities that can be seen or even felt on top of the nose with more traditional techniques. Well, that about wraps up the overview on rhinoplasty, including the technical nuances that different plastic surgeons may use to provide some really life changing results. Join me in the next video when I will be talking about how to prepare yourself for rhinoplasty and what to expect.